Lovin', your friendly librarian, and I'm back with some book love. Let's chat. So we're gonna start off with a toasted marshmallow latte from Kava House in Wilmington, Ohio. I had to be somewhere there at noon today, so then afterward, I ran to Goodwill because they have a great book selection in Wilmington, Ohio at the Goodwill. I don't know if it's because it's a college town or what, but I always seem to find some good stuff there. And then um, I stopped at Kava House and got so a food and drink to go to bring it back because I've got a gajillion things to do as we slide into our last week of last full week of school year plus two days afterward and then another work day but whatever we're gonna call it the last week of school and then I'm sure by the time I get to the end of this video we will move over to an adult beverage <laughs> so this is the last time this year I get to use the excuse that I'm working and overwhelmed and I don't have time to get everything super organized uh, and the rest of the videos that I do for the summer, I will have plenty of time to do them. I've got a lot of little segments that I really want to get wrapped up today so I can put some books on the shelf. And then when summer comes, one of my big summer goals is to rearrange my bookshelves, get them cleaned, organized, things put in order. You can't see it, but maybe I'll try and take a picture. But I have books on the floor here where I recommend a book a day in my school library. So if I have a copy there and a copy here, I've put those on the bottom down here while I've been doing book reviews on Goodreads and I have not really been including those in the videos so I'm going to do like a breakout video of just those books. Some of them right there on that shelf, some of those are the ones that I had already talked about in my YouTube videos and then I recommended to my class. And then underneath that, those are the ones that I've done um, during our YouTube videos. So just want to get myself a little more organized. Also, I know I've said this before, but up there at the very top um, where you see the Kate Carlisle, Eric Erickson, the Lillian Jackson Braun, Cleo Coyle, the coffee house lady. All of those, I want to do a little breakout cozy video because those seem to do really well. So I know there's a ton of other cozy people out there that love those. Um, and then just do a quick review of those other cozies up there that I've already reviewed on my YouTube um, videos. Uh, and then I've got other uh, cozies up there that are on my Tubi Red list. Huge, huge, huge summer reading list, of course. I'm going to do it a little bit different this year, I think. Usually I have like, um, you know, we have 10, 11, 12 weeks of summer depending on how it all falls. And I'm like, these are the books that I'm going to read this summer. And I think this summer I've just got so many different avenues that I want to do that I'm going to have a couple of stacks of books and then just choose from those stacks. So I think I'll do it a little bit different and I also think I'll do a breakout video of that. And I might wait to do that until the summer actually hits because as always, I've waited a whole month and so I have a big stack of books to talk to you about. I have a stack of books that I reviewed. Oh, and it's out of the video there, but there's a stack of um, book haul books and then some that are on my short list and some that I've borrowed that I want to read. So a couple of different stacks going on. The other book haul books wouldn't even fit onto the table. So I'll have to like move things around a little bit during the video today, which I'm fine with. Um, but I have done a lot of book shopping here lately. I know some of that was driven by the fact that whenever I recommend a book to my students in class, I always like to have the copy of the book that they can have. Um, and I'm not real crazy, like I've done it a couple of times this year uh, because I just can't stand myself, but I'm not real crazy about taking my books from the house in and taking them in because I don't want to like have to worry about if they're coming back or if they're not coming back. Um, so I have had tons of donations this year for my classroom library and I can't even express to you how happy I am about that, how grateful I am about that. Um, so I have had, what I think in the end we're going to have 158 days with kids. I'm pretty sure that's right. And I will have had 158 books that I've read that I can recommend that I have in my classroom that they can take. And then kind of once they're already in there and I recommend them and they go out to the kids, um, it is, I'd like give it out to the universe and I hope it comes back. But if it doesn't, I'm okay with that. Um, so that's why I don't really like to take my ones in from home um, because I don't know. I mean, I do understand I'm a freak. I've mentioned that numerous times. So I don't know how you are with your books, but if I have a book and I loan it out, I hope that it does come back. And like in my mind, I know what books I own um, or what books are on my shelf that I need to read. Like I'm a librarian and I think all of that just stays up there in a different way. So super excited about that classroom book review that will be upcoming and I will do that in a separate video and uh, since it's 158 books I'll obviously have to split split that up into videos yeah I'm really excited about doing that one so I hope that you are too 
That being said, my birthday was April 9th and my students found out that I do YouTube videos. So um, I think I was at like 90 subscribers, something like that, somewhere around there, um, right before my birthday hit. And when they found that out for my birthday, um, they like put it out there everywhere. And I went up over 100 subscribers right after, my, or actually I think it was on my birthday. I was over 100 subscribers. Um, and again, that's just super fun. I'm not, like, this is not my living. I was watching a um, book chat video this morning on YouTube, and she had gone to buy some books at Powell's Books in Seattle. Is that right? I think, or Portland? I don't know. <laughs> One of those two. Anywho, and she had said, like, oh, look at all these books. I feel kind of guilty. Number one, never feel guilty about buying my books. I don't, I've never had that feeling. But number two, she said, but I do make my living off of these videos. I don't make my living off of this. This is free therapy, free fun. And uh, I feel like I'm putting out in the universe that love of books and everything that I get back from that. So happy to do it. All right, that being said, love my new uh, t-shirt. Let's discuss books. I'll put the link in the notes because I don't know, it's just Inkwell, Inkwell Press, I believe is what it's called. But I'll definitely put the link down there for that. They have great book t-shirts. And this, uh, you know, when I'm, I'm not a good online shopper and because I never know how it's gonna like feel and I love this, I really, really love it. So uh, I've already worn it, I mean, a half a dozen times. Uh, I've worn it on book chat days, so super good. Easy uh, to find a place to wear it to. And I could not wait to make this video so that I could wear my new t-shirt for you. So remember when you were in school and you got super excited about library day? I mean, I did, I don't know if you did. I know that I had students in the last 20 years of being a librarian who would talk about, oh, I was so excited when I figured out it was library day. Um, so just think of this as like an adult library day. You can just turn on the video or turn on the audio and somebody's gonna talk about books with you for the next hopefully less than an hour, but I'm not making any promises because I'm terrible at that. So thanks for being one of my new subscribers if you're one of those, or thanks for being one of my subscribers from the beginning uh, and just going on this journey of book love with me. Making the videos, I found that it really challenged me. And as I am nearing that half century mark next year, um, I really feel like that lifelong learner and trying to do things that you don't understand and trying to figure them out helps keep you young and healthy. So this has been a great creative outlet. I'm gonna insert a quick picture of my 2020 read shelf. Most of these I talked about once I started the videos in, was it March or April? I can't remember um, when my first book video came out. But most of these I reviewed since then. But just in case, gonna give you a really quick um, look at my 2020 read shelf before I integrate them in with the other ones. So here are some of those 2020 reads. Um, I know I didn't do Waiting for Tom Hanks, but some of these others, I might have gone back through and did it, but The Year of Cozy, The Scent Keeper, which I believe I did with a book club. Hmm, can't remember which one it was. Maybe it was Reese's book club, maybe. I had been reading the one year chronological Bible for a while, like it obviously it took me longer than one year, but I try and read through the Bible every couple of years, um, and that was a good way to do it. A Gentleman in Moscow was one of our book club books. I read C.S. Lewis as The Great Divorce, right before going to the Aronoff and seeing a show um, that was like uh, C.S. Lewis came on the stage. It was, I think it was called An Evening with C.S. Lewis. I went with my cousin, it was awesome. And we did that like right before COVID hit. There's a Mary Inglebright Spring, which is just a cute little book. Lisa Gardner's Find Her. I think someone gave me that. Stilettos by Lexi Ryan. That is a fun one, a little risque. Morgan Bryan is a girl that I teach with, and she self-published that Impossibly perfect normal, Perfectly Normal. Uh, American Dirt, I read right at the beginning of the school year. There's a Lillian Jackson Braun. I'm Still Here was sent to me by the... By the Reese Witherspoon Book Club. Back in the spring, I made a, vi a video and sent it in. She was looking to hire a librarian. Never heard anything back from that, and I don't know that she actually ever did um, hire anybody, but I got that one out of the, the uh, deal, so that was kind of cool. Uh, Grace Not Perfection by Emily Lay. She's a planner girl. That's a nonfiction fun one. Lucy Follies The Guest List. Oh, I think that came at the same time. Um, for the Reese Witherspoon one, if I'm not mistaken. I think they sent me both of those through like a Instagram thing. I don't know if it was attached to the interview or not the interview with the, um, the pitch to be her librarian or how that worked. Uh, Bruno Martin Walker, that chief of police, Bruno chief of police, Martin Walker. That was one of our book club reads. I picked up Bogle's I'd Rather Be Reading. 
at Cincinnati's Books by the Banks, I think in the fall of maybe 2019, maybe. Uh, Collins, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I know I had started um, doing the book chats by then because I did a real long one out on the porch for that one. I really like that book. There's Sounder. That Sounder is um, a Newberry book. I've been trying to read some of those. Kate Carlisle, I'm one of her uh, Kate's readers. And that one got shipped to me for free. And I read all of her books. It's part of the Bibliophile Mystery Series. And I love them. Hacking School Discipline was a book uh, group that we did. Um, a book club. And that was done during quarantine. But we did it all online. So that was cool. That little black book in there had something to do with Lent, as I recall. The Case of the Missing Men is a graphic novel that one of my friends gave me, I think, for my birthday. Um, Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down is on there. Um, that's a fabulous one. The Sky is Everywhere by Nelson. Ripped from the Pages, another Kate Carlisle bibliophile mystery. The Halloween Tree by Bradbury. Um, I did that with my class. Vampire's Bone and Triacle Scones was one of my Halloween reads. House of Leaves was a scary one. Um, Celeste Ning's Everything I Never Told You. Uh, Hope Misplaced is a local girl that I grew up with. It is her um, self-published memoir. Lillian Jackson Braun, Short and Tall Tales, where I was trying to finish up hers. The Cat Companion is also a Jackson Braun. A Christmas Carol Murder was a cozy Christmas murder mystery. Mary Englebright's Autumn, Death of a Christmas Caterer by Lee Hollis, another cozy Christmas. Uh, Mayhem and Mass was um, not Christmas, I don't think. It was a Sister Lou cozy mystery, but a fun one. Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered by Karen Kilgariff and Georgia Hardstark, the My Favorite Murder podcast girls. And Free Range Netter by Pearl McPhee, which was a nonfiction book of essays. So that's um, my 2020, yes, my 2020 uh, bookshelf. So just real quick, just wanted to review that before... I um, put those in with my uh, regular shelf. All right, let's so let's start off with some of the books that I have finished since the last time we talked. Now, this is my 2021 stack up until about right here, I think is where I stopped the last time. So these books here are the ones that I will be talking about that I have finished since the last time I did this video, which was about a month ago. The first one on our list is by Kate Carlisle. It's Books of a Feather. It is number 10 in the Bibliophile Mystery Series. Remember, full disclosure, I am one of Kate's readers. Kate's readers. I need to look that up. I can't remember what we actually call ourselves or what she calls us. But she does uh, mail free books to me after, right after they're published um, with the understanding that I will put out reviews on a couple of different platforms. Honest reviews, I'm always honest about it, but luckily I really love her books. I love her bibliophile uh, mystery series. And then she also has the Fixer Upper mystery series. And you will recognize some of her Fixer Up mystery series titles because they are on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries as a series, with Jewel as the main character. But the book that I read is Books of a Feather, and it's part of the bibliophile mystery series. Now, I've been reading Kate Carlisle since about 2013, I think, and it was one where I started in the middle somewhere, and then it's a cozy mystery series. Remember, cozy mystery series are really where there might be a mystery, uh, there might be a murder, but it's not graphic. They don't put out a whole lot of details like that. It's not gory. Um, it's not dark or super serious. Um, it's more based on the community that is around whatever, wherever the murder takes place. So for the Bibliophile mystery series, it's the main character, Brooklyn Wainwright, I believe it is. She is a book restorer, um, and people hire her to uh, give a book that's maybe super old or super expensive and to rework it, put it back together, or clean it up in some way, so that's her job. I really enjoy that aspect of the mystery series, in addition to Brooklyn and her whole family and the people that are in her circle. They're just fun. I'm pretty sure it's Kate's Raider. I started doing that in about 2015. So I was reading or listening to her books on audio for probably about two years, year and a half to two years before I applied to be one of her uh, raters and then ended up getting some of her books for free. But they're also easy to find at the library through my public library's app called Libby. I'm pretty sure that's how I listen to this one. Um, and then I've also picked up a number of them at half price books. So super easy to find. And I like all the versions of the books. I like the physical version, so you can see I do have a lot of her physical books up there. But I also like the audios. I like the voice of the person who's doing that. 
They do really well whenever I am working around my house all day and I have something on, I can put my earbud in or I just, you know, start my phone and carry it around in my pocket, old fashioned, old lady style. I do prefer the small paperbacks, but they come out in hardback. You can get the small paperbacks or you can get the eBooks. This is the last bibliophile one that I needed to do to catch up until the new number 15 comes out, I believe next month. So I'm anxiously awaiting that one. That one's called Little Black Book. Brooklyn's one of those people that has the gift or the curse, whichever way you may see it, of always finding dead bodies or dead people turning up dead, dead when they're around her. She's a bit like Jessica Fletcher. I would be a little concerned to be her friend. We meet multiple people like you. We've already met Ian in one of the previous books, maybe two or three of the previous books. He's come around, she's gone to meet him or whatever, and then she goes back in to meet him again. And then something will be centered around that. That's not to say that Ian is the one who's going to get killed. I'm not giving any spoilers away there. I was a little concerned for Ian's safety when he came back into this one and Brooklyn was hanging around. Someone comes to meet Brooklyn, hands her a book to redo, and then that's when everything transpires. I do always like to look at the reviews, especially on these, to see if I'm up to par on how much I'm telling or not telling in a particular review. And I read a review on this one and she said, I think it was a she, said the characters are too sweet, too handsome, too beautiful, too perfect. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a cozy mystery series. That's how they are. I don't know that there's a cozy mystery series that I find truly believable with all of the beautiful people and the wonderful places and making a living running a used bookstore or re, you know redoing books. Like, that's not what I'm looking for in a cozy series. So once again, Books of a Feather, the Bibliophile Mystery Series by Kate Carlisle is a win for me. The next book I finished, I actually listened to it on audio. One of my friends from high school recommended it to me because she knows I love true crime. Um, my Favorite Murder is one of my favorite podcasts. I love to just listen to them telling all the details from a particular murder or case. Um, and so this one is called Submerged, just by Janice Heisel. That's how I'm gonna say it. I listened to it on audio and then this also will make an appearance in my book haul. Um, portion of the video. I found it, um, you know, after I had read it, I think at Goodwill, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm so glad that I did find it in print to put on my shelf and to give it to people because I've talked a lot about this one since I finished it. I know at least three people that I've talked to about it who've then gone and listened to the book also, um, but there are certain parts in it that I would really like to go back and reference, and then the other thing is when I was listening to the audio, I, you know, if I pick up a book, I always look to see who the publisher is and the layout of the book. I'm very into the physical book. Um, and on this one, I just listened to the audio without that kind of judgment. I don't know if judgment's the word I want to use without that kind of picture of it. I don't know. So anywho, what I ended up just listening to it and I loved it. I love that the author of the book is the one that read it to you. And then when I actually got the book, you can totally tell that it's self-published. And the formatting, like, you know, I'm always big on my kids, like, if you make a paragraph, what should paragraphs be? They should be indented. None of these paragraphs are indented. They're super short, choppy, I don't know, I wouldn't even call them paragraphs. Um, it's pieced together a little differently. And I think I would have been turned off by that if I were actually reading it. So I'm really glad that I listened to it. And then after I picked it up, the other thing is, uh, when I was listening to it, she often would refer to photos um, and when I picked it up then, it was interesting that she then, when she kept talking about the scary Ryan photo, it was interesting that I actually get to see it. I did try and look some of them up online when I was listening to it, but I actually listened to this on the way down to Florida, flying to my cousins for spring break and flying back. And then like when I was there in the evenings, I would turn it on to listen to it a little bit before I went to bed. So for me, it did not seem like it was very long. Like I finished it in record time. Um, and I feel like one of my friends that finished it afterward was like, oh, it took me forever. It seemed like it was really long. So it may have been on audio, but um, it worked out for the time of my life whenever I was listening to it. But I really, really like it. Um, I don't want to tell too much, but what I think was, um, what drew me into this was right at the very beginning, Janice Heisel, the author, she was a journalist during the time that the... Um, that the case happened and during the three murder trials, I think it was three murder trials, um, and 
she is looking back. This is like a 10 year retrospective. This time she went and she got lots of other materials that did not come up in court or she didn't see during the first time when she was handling, um, telling the story. I think she got out of journalism and then she wanted to go back and just put all this together and see if she could find that like one thing that said, you know, we've made the right decision. He should be convicted of murder. He should be serving time in jail. That's what she was trying to do. Um, so she's very honest throughout the book of giving you the information and not like throwing her judgment out there. I just listened to a My Favorite Murder today on the way to Wilmington and um, I think it was Georgia said she was going to tell you about the Lacey Pat Patterson, Lacey Peterson case and she was like, I'm not going to put any judgment in there. I'm not going to put what I think about it and then totally said, this is ridiculous. I mean, he is totally guilty. So um, she does not do that in here. Uh, I feel like that she does a really good job of just laying everything out in front of you. And then when you get to the end, then she gives you some, a little bit more of her opinion, I feel like. Um, but in the end, um, I'm still not even sure how I feel. And I'm not really sure how she feels. She puts some stuff out there. And I'm just going to let you figure that part out for yourself. But this was a really enjoyable listen, um, especially if you're a true crime podcast listener. This is a good one because it... it reads like that or it um when I'm listening that's what it sounds like to me I love podcasts I love the telling of a story and that's what this was this is a local case for us this happened um in Mason Ohio was it Mason I think it was Mason which is not very far from here you find a lot of uh or primary source information in here that did not come out during the trial I don't know that I followed it that closely when it was happening but I knew some some of the details some of the things that came through but I wasn't really following true crime um, at that time. So this was a really fresh telling for me. The Whitmers were married for just four short months before this happened. Ryan claims that he was downstairs when his new wife was upstairs and she had retreated to take a bath. And then when he went upstairs, that's when he found her and she had drowned in the bathtub. He calls 911, they come and secure the area. And then it is very quickly after that that Ryan is accused of causing this um, and then uh, undergoes the whole trial, multiple trials. There's a couple of things that happen in the book that I'm like, oh no, please don't do that. I mean, that's a terrible, terrible sign. That looks terrible. But I think by the time I got to the end of the book, I was also realizing that although something might look terrible, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are guilty or that you're innocent. <laughs> This is a great example of laying all the evidence out on the table and letting us figure out where we think um, our beliefs lie and whether or not we think that the justice system did its job or not. Highly recommend Submerged by Janice Heisel, The Ryan Whitmer, His Drowned Bride, and The Justice System. Super good listen. So the other book that I finished on spring break was Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, An African Childhood by Alexandra Fuller. I do not have a copy of the book. I borrowed my cousin's when I was in Florida. This is the first time that I flew and did not take any luggage. I didn't even take a carry-on. I took a personal item bag uh, and I went there for a week. So I didn't take any books. I just borrowed her books when I was there and I listened to audiobooks and I had my Kindle and my phone. So it was a bit of a um, experience, but I feel like I did a really good job at it. And she has an excellent selection of books. I'm really glad that I read this while I was down there. So Fuller tells a very honest um, story about growing up in Africa. You can see here, she is white. Her parents um, were eccentric um, and not necessarily healthy mentally. Um, and I'm always just amazed that these people feel like that they can write these memories of their childhood or their memoirs or I don't know how, how you want to say it, but how they can write that and be so honest about their parents and their upbringing and their parents still talk to them <laughs> because it's not a very positive light. Um, it, they struggled. They really, really struggled and her and her sister were in peril um, many times, many times. So I'm also a teacher and educator, so I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who do not treat their children like precious jewels. <laughs> like, um, I just don't, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people like that. I don't understand not putting your children first. I just, I don't. 
So this is a bit of a difficult one for me, but I enjoyed the telling of the story. They um, had a very eclectic life. It's always entertaining. Her story of coming of age in Africa during an odd time politically and in the world um, is just super interesting. I'm really glad I read it. I will be recommending this to my book club. And Fuller doesn't place any blame anywhere. She tells the story of her family, but it seems pretty factual. There's not a lot of judgment going out there. So I really enjoyed that part of it. She also doesn't add a lot to the political commentary of what was going on there. Um, you know, I'm not great on history or politics. I'm interested in it, but I'm not good about knowing what happened where and how the colonization happened or, you know, the segregation that was happening. Like, I'm not good at any of that. But she put enough in there to give me something to work with um, without giving a huge, like, political platform out there, which she totally could have done in this kind of book. She talks about her parents' motivation for moving the family to Africa, and then they move around quite a bit within the country. The other thing that I like about a book like this is the title is always intriguing, like, don't let's go to the dogs tonight. Where is that coming from? So I can't wait, and when I'm reading, I just cannot wait until it finally brings itself to light. And she does include a poem. The title comes from a poem by A.P. Herbert. Um, and I feel like it was about midway to even past that in the book before the poem comes up and you realize that's where she got her title. I always think that's interesting. So highly recommend it. I will be recommending it to my book club for next year, uh, next year's read. It's a great memoir and one that I've been meaning to read. We moved back to Ohio in like 1996 or seven, I think it was. And I immediately joined a book club in Blanchester and they had either, um, this was on their list at some point too, and somehow I missed it. Somehow I missed reading it. So it's been on my reading list for a long time, so I'm glad I finally got to it. The next book that I'm going to show you, um, I'm putting it in the library as a book. It's called Hello Possibility, and it's called A Gift Book by Kelly Ray Roberts. It's more of like a little um, artistic flip through. I think my sister gave it to me for my birthday as like a card. Um, but you can see here, it's just a nice little artistic um, book with some sayings. I like that it's got the ephemera in there. Just super cute little book. So I did add that to my list and I will be putting it on my shelves. The next book that I finished is Thrill Ride by Rachel Hawthorne. She also did Love on the Lifts. Um, all of her books like the, look like these like Easter egg colors. I have several of them in the high school library, and I really like her. She's definitely a young adult um, author, but this one really fell short for me. But I think I gave it maybe three out of five stars because I really like some of her books. Yes, they're written for young adults. Yes, they're just um, little romancy books that are fun, but usually her characters are a lot more spunky. This one was just pathetic to me. She was just waiting on a guy the whole time. You could tell he wasn't even into her and she was just going to waste an entire summer waiting on someone instead of having fun with the person that was in front of her. So it just really fell flat for me. And I've read several of her other books and I really like her. Um, so I did Love on the Lifts and Snowed In and Sweet Dreams and they all have pretty strong female characters. So I'm not sure why she, you know, fell short on this one. This one is kind of written in kind of like a diary, sort of, like it shows some of her diary and then it'll just be a little bit of a telling then afterward. Um, but it just fell short for me. The next one that I finished was Death by Espresso. It's an Alec Erickson cozy mystery. Again, I have some of his books up here and I will probably do a breakout video of those at some point too. Maybe this summer when I have all of these great big plans. But I really enjoy the Bookstore Cafe Mystery Series by Alex Erickson, and this is number six in that series. And it's also my sixth one that I've read. I listened to the audio version of this one. I've listened to a lot of his series on audio because again, I enjoy the audio version of these and they're super easy to listen to. I usually can finish them in one or two days when I have stuff around the house that I have to get done or I'm working on the porch on doing something and I can just play and listen to them as I'm doing something else. Super easy reads and just fun. The first few editions of his books in this series I picked up at Books by the Banks here in Cincinnati. He, I don't think he's been there in the last two times maybe that I've gone though. I hope he returns because I would like to purchase some more of the books in actual physical form. Chrissy Hancock is the main character and she owns a um, bookstore 
uh, in a small town. I feel like it's in Colorado, something like that. Her dad is a famous author, murder mystery author, I believe. Um, and again, she's one of those people you probably don't want to be friends with her because she always seems to come up on people who have died. In this one, Chrissy's co-owner of the bookstore um, cafe uh, is getting married and their parents are all coming in for the wedding. And uh, it just that whole wedding ugh, that happens, the not so nice part about a wedding, all follows them in. And that's when one of the um, people who show up in town end up dead. Her parents bring in Kathy as a guest wedding planner to help um, Chrissy, not Chrissy, to help Vicki plan her wedding. And she's constantly chomping on espresso beans. And that is to her demise. Chrissy's also having some boyfriend issues in this one, which was a little odd because I was like, had to go back and review where we were in the relationship. So um, that was kind of a downer in this particular one, but I'm sure that'll pick up too because every cozy has some kind of cozy relationship in it. I don't know. So the usual antics continue and this is a great caffeine cozy read. This is in that series that's like Death by Coffee, Death by Tea, Death by Pumpkin Spice, Death by Vanilla Latte, Death by Eggnog. Um, it's in that series. There are, it looks like four more that I need to get to. Death by Mocha and then some uh, Christmas ones. So looking forward to that and I'll probably pace myself out a little bit. The next book that I finished, I loved, loved, loved. I'm so glad I finally made it to The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. I have followed him on um, social media for a while. I don't really know. I feel like uh, I knew he was an author, public speaker, motivator, inspirational person, influencer out there. Um, and I know that he speaks a lot towards mental health. So I think that's how I ended up starting to listen to him. And I knew that this one was out there. I've seen it on tons of booktubes and my Instagram book people, bookstagram. Um, just I've seen it everywhere and I just hadn't gotten to it. We have a couple of students at the school who wanted to do a student book club, so this was their first choice that they did. Um, so we ordered these. It also was on the Good Morning America book club, which I've um, been telling my kids about at school. I'm hoping that they start joining some of these online book clubs. There's so many choices. And if you have any good suggestions for high school aged online uh, virtual book clubs, I would love to hear them. Super glad that I finally got to read this one though because it is unique and an easy one to recommend again. This is another one I will be recommending to my own book club. Not often does a book really live up to the hype that I see. Again, I am a huge book follower, so I watch the booktubes. I uh, you know, have tons of people on Instagram, on the bookstagram that I follow. I'm seeing book, co book covers everywhere. I go to independent bookstores. I go to mass bookstores. If I'm in the environment Kroger, I look to see what books are on the shelf. So I see a lot of books, um, and when I see a cover as much as this one, like Target, Costco, Sam's Club, when I see a book like this and the cover's been everywhere, I'm usually disappointed when I go to read it. Um, I usually feel like, oh, this is for people who don't read a lot and they think this book is amazing, but it's just because you haven't read these other amazing books. Excuse my book snobbery, this is not that way. This definitely lives up to the hype. I think people should read it. I think people should talk about it. I think book clubs should use it. It gives you tons of talking points. I would classify it as science fiction, alternative reality. Um, like I said, it's super unique. It's hard to put in another place. There are a couple of books like Night Circus that are out there um, that when you read it, you're like, oh gosh, I can't really think of another book that's like that. Like when you finish this one, what should you read? I even read a couple of articles that said, if you finish uh, Midnight Library, what should you read next? But even looking through those, like I had read some of the books that were on those lists and I'm like, mm, I don't know, it's still, um, it stands on its own for me. It definitely stands out there as a book that I want people to read and talk to me about. And our students did a great job when we met um, of leading the discussion because of course the first thing they said was where would your place be? So the main character in the book um, is not happy with her life. She decides to end it. And uh, when this happens in this particular book's reality, she ends up in a library. And in the library, there are alternate, um, alternate ways that her life could have gone had she have made other decisions. Um, and then she does meet other people out there 
uh, in these different lives that she tries on that are in the same position she is. They're, I can't remember what they call them, like life hoppers or something. I can't remember what, she, what the guy called it. But um, his is a video store. So he's in a video store and there are all these videos that are alternate places for him. So my student's question was, what would your place be? What would you be in? Obviously, I feel like mine's a library or a bookstore or even, you know, somewhere where there's just tons of books. But I thought that was a great question um, and one that I will be posing to my own book club if they will decide to read this one. Matt Haig also has a memoir that I think has been super popular. It is called Stay Alive. Um, and that might be when it came out whenever he got onto my radar. Now, that being said, this definitely has some language in there, some situations that are pretty mature. So I would recommend this for very mature high school readers. Um, but the main character, I think she's right at 30. So um, I don't know how they marketed this. I thought it was marketed as a young adult book. I wouldn't call it a young adult book. I think this is, um, what's, there's gotta be a term for that. So when I say young adult, I think high school age kids. So whatever that 20 something, 30 something person is, so that they're, they're adult, but on the younger side, that's where I would market this book to. But my book club is a much older book club and I, to, I still totally think that they will really like this main character and the questions that it poses on how things could have turned out differently. Where in your life do you see a place that could have turned out differently? Highly recommend The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. It opens with a Sylvia Plath quote. You know, that's one of those things I love when I'm talking to you about a book. Actually, he's got a bunch of books that are there. Um, it says uh, there's like a number of books and then a number of books for children. So he's a pretty established author. Um, just came onto my radar here probably in the last year or so. But it does open with a Sylvia Plath quote. I can never be all the people I want and live all the lives I want. I've heard that quote so many times. I can never train myself on all the skills I want. And why do I want? I want to live and feel all the shades, tones, and variations of mental and physical experience possible in my life. Sylvia Plath, um, who is well known for her mental stages. Mm, love it. Love it, love it, love it. I also talked about this theory where you really should only have about 50 people in your circle, like in your community of people that you know, which I think is an interesting number to pull out there. I think it's called Dunbar's number is what he attributed it to. Um, and that there are just so many things that come up in this book that made me stop and really think about it and be like, hmm, how's that even possible in today's, you know, um, social networking? There are so many people just here lately who passed away from COVID or got sick, seriously sick. And I feel terrible because I feel like I personally know them. They don't know me at all, but I know them through their influencer account or their social media accounts. So um, I feel like our circles are much wider now. And I do feel stressed that there are that many more people to be concerned about, I guess. But I don't know. I thought it was an interesting concept. The next book that I read, I do not have a copy of it. I borrowed it from a student, but it is Angie Thomas, Angie Thomas's Concrete Rose. It's the backstory to The Hate You Give. It's the father in The Hate You Give. It's his story when he's a teenager, when he has seven, um, when he has a girl pregnant with seven, their son, and then he gets the, um, the Hate You Give stars mom pregnant with star at the same time. So those two kids, he has two women, um, he's 17, 18 years old when he gets both of these girls pregnant at the same time, which is the backstory to The Hate You Give. So I liked it. I liked The Hate You Give, and that's one that I definitely did not think I was going to like. Somebody kept telling me, read it, read it, read it, Stephanie. Read it, read it, read it. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to read this. It's just too much. I, we hear about it all the time, and is this too dark? I can't handle all of this. And then I started reading, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Everybody should read this book. It just deals with so much of what is underlying all of these problems that we're having right now. Um, so really, really highly recommend The Hate You Give. But uh, Concrete Rose fell a little flatter for me. It was good. Um, it just was extra. It was just extra for me. Like if you love The Hate You Give, then you're gonna appreciate reading this, but it's just, it was not as impactful for me as The Hate You Give. It gives you a, clear view into how um, 
Maverick was raised in that um, world of having to be with the, was it the king, the king lords? his family and what led up to him being in that and trying to get out of it and having these two girls pregnant at the same time. So you get a lot of that back, that back story. Um, so I'm glad that she wrote it. I'm glad that I read it. Um, and I will recommend it to my students if they have already read The Hate You Give, but I would definitely read The Hate You Give first. So I do recommend it, but I gave it three out of five stars. The next one I read was Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI by David Gran. I picked this one up at Brooklyn Pizza and Pasta in Montgomery, uh, which is just a little hole in the wall pizza place. But she had a bookshelf over there. Of course, I go over and take a look at it because I love looking at people's bookshelves. And um, the lady that was working there, owner, I'm not sure exa exactly what she was, but um, she said, hey, take anything you want if you see something you want to read. So, of course, I picked this one up. Then she comes over and we talk books for a while, which is one of the things I love about the whole book community. Everybody wants to talk about what they've read, what they're reading, what they like, what they don't like. Um, so... Uh, that was back in the spring, probably just a month or two ago, and this has just been on my short list, and they are turning it into a movie this year, Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese, among a lot of other high-profile people, so I am super interested to see how they're going to do it. Highly recommend the read, especially true crime fans. Hmm, I did Submerged and this one in the last month. That's interesting. I don't know that I put those two things together, but um, super good book. Lots of first-hand um, information that is out there. I really like that about it. Um, it happened in the 1920s. We don't hear a lot about it. Maybe because, again, we don't worry so much. And this, again, was on that My Favorite Murder episode today where she did the um, Lacey Peterson case. And then there was another lady that she mentioned who had a very similar thing happen to her. And her name, I think, was Hernandez. And she said, look at this, here we go again. Uh, you know, a beautiful white girl this happens to, high profile, everybody's out there looking, it's on the media, and then Hernandez, and we don't even know her name. Um, and that's very much, I think, what happened with this Os the Osage murders. I hope I'm saying that right. But with the Native American people, whenever this was happening to them, people were already angry at the Osage Nation because when... Um, when we took their land or bought their land or however you want to say it um then there was there were oil um discoveries afterward so we then had to pay them for those oil discoveries so these people uh made a lot of money off of that as they should it was their land um but people were bitter over that because then these native americans were walking around with all of this money and these shows of all of this money um, and so people were angry about that. So whenever they started dying and being found dead, shot or poisoned or whatever, people just weren't really that concerned. So luckily, finally, it did get the attention of J. Edgar Hoover. He um, got a Texas Ranger at the time, Tom White, or a former Texas Ranger. Um, he might have been former by then, but Tom White. He got him to go down and take over the investigation and get to the bottom of what was happening there. Um, and that is the beginning of the FBI. So it is very wordy. I mean, you, you got to be a serious uh, lover of true crime when you're reading things like this and submerged just like that too. They are giving you a ton of information for you to um, get the full picture of the whole case and then also be able to make your own decisions about how you feel about things. And then in this particular one, I feel like he does some of that overload on the information so that... Um, you don't know which direction he's going. So you're in the same boat as Tom White and his crew when he was down there and investigating all of this, and then he would uncover something else. And he'd be like, well, is this related? Or is this just another horrible thing that's happened? Like, what is going on here? Who is responsible? It could be this person because they're dirty, but they might just be dirty and not involved in this. So I really like how the story progresses to that. Um, and then the ending is just punch you in the gut people are terrible <laughs> so i'm gonna need a really good read after this of um how great humanity is because humanity is terrible in this book for sure david grant has another book oh actually it's right here 
Somewhere along the line, I picked this up. It's an advanced reader copy of The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon, and that's by him. So this has been on my shelf for a while. I don't even know where it came from, um, but I've been meaning to read this one, and then, of course, I picked this one up and read it within the same month. So this one will go back on the reading shelf, and I'll get to it sometime soon, I hope. This was a national book finalist um, and really popular. This is another one that is referenced a lot when I'm listening to any of the true crime um, shows. They reference this book and this journalist quite a bit. So it was important that I feel like I've got to get to some of those that are getting mentioned over and over again, but I should know and I just, I haven't read them. It takes place in Oklahoma in the 1920s on the Osage Indian Nation. It tells the story basically of Molly Burkhart and her family. Her family, um, she has a sister who dies. Her mother dies slowly. She has another sister who's found murdered. I mean, they, these things are all happening right around her. And you just, you're trying to figure out, is this a coincidence or are they just a um, targeted nation? What else? I was listening to something else today. What was I listening to? Some other podcast or maybe it was just a segment on NPR. It might have been just a segment on NPR that was talking about the reason we can do awful, pe awful things to other people is that we see them as other and not us. And so that's one of the ways I think that people said these people deserved it because they are less than. Um, and we do that to a lot of different people in our world. Um, and I believe it was today on NPR that I was listening to that segment and that little snippet just... That's so true. That's people, everybody needs somebody to look down on and that's how they justify the way that they treat people. I really like how Grant is able to describe the relationships between people, the persecution between the nation, um, the Indian nation and the, the people that are living there and around them. They very much blame them for what they see as wasting their money. It's their money, but <laughs> that's what we do. He uses a lot of uh, primary and unpublished information uh, up until the time. So FBI files, jury testimony, court transcripts, he puts all that together. So it does make it very wordy, but um, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading the whole thing and getting all that information out there. So I highly recommend this for true crime fans also. I'll link the article down below that talks about Flower Moon. Uh, being turned into a movie. Like I said, it's with Leonardo DiCaprio. Jesse Plemons is the other name that's on there. Um, I think he plays one of the bad guys too. I don't know him as well. It's terrible how I feel like I've kind of fallen off the radar of like who's popular in movies, like who are actors that are out there right now. But um, I'm really excited to see this one come to light. It says it's going to be released in 2022. So you've got time to read the book. Get on it. Put it on your short list. I'll also put the uh, My Favorite Murder episode where they talk about it becoming a movie where I got that article from. It's My Favorite Murder episode 270 and it comes in at the 23 uh, minute mark. Um, but you might want to listen to them talk about it being made into the movie also. Another very short one that I picked up and I'm sure I've read it before, but it's E.E. E. Cummings. It's in just spring, but it's a beautiful little children's book that has paintings. Um, it looks like I picked it up at like a library sale because it's a discard from the Public Library of Cincinnati. But I did use this with my students and I'm adding it to my um, list here as books that I finished so that I can put it on my shelf. Um, but it is E.E. E. Cummings' poem in just spring and it's got these lovely little illustrations. So I read it to my class the first day of spring and we talked a little bit about E.E. E. Cummings and how he uses the lower, the lower case um, letters unusually and how his poetry is as much visual as it is what it says um, and these paintings are beautiful too did I tell you the paintings are by Heidi Gannell g-o-e-n-n-e-l I don't think I did but adding that one to my read stack also it's a great seasonal little book the last book I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you about it um, but I don't have it in my hands because I think I left it at school and I also have not put it on the um, Goodreads review yet, so I will do that later today and throw that one out there uh, so that you can find it on Goodreads. But it's called The Rhythm Section. It's by Brunel. One of my students gifted it to me. She picked up a copy for herself. I think she said she got it at Ollie, which I've not gone to an Ollie. I need to do that. Um, but she picked it up at Ollie, and then she liked it, so the next time she was there, she picked up a copy for me. Um, I thought it sounded familiar, so I looked, and it is a movie on 
Amazon Prime. I think it was Amazon Prime. So I watched that um, sometime, I think, last week, too. Pretty graphic movie, pretty graphic book, but super good. Um, thriller is definitely what I would call it. There's a young girl. Her whole family has been um, killed on an airplane. It was a bombing incident. Um, I'm not sure if they tell her that it's a bombing incident, but that's it comes very apparent. And then someone comes to her. Her life has spiraled down since she lost her family. She very much blames herself for not being there. She was supposed to be with them. She was a teenager at the time and not, not nice to her parents. Um, so she lost them at a very delicate time in her life. Um, so then someone comes and finds her when she is really spiraled out of control and says, hey, I have some information. We need to get revenge on these people. And she gets drawn into that very dark underworld. Um, to where she is going to get revenge for her family. So super good thriller, um, good movie. I wish I again could recall people that are in it, but um, high profile people that are in that movie. I recognize several people. The lead person is a very well known person, um, but look that one up. Good movie, good book. I'm very thankful when anybody hands me a book and says, hey, I read this and I think you're gonna like it. I will always read it. I told you I didn't have a copy of it, I do. Here's the rhythm section by Mark Burnell and you can see she picked it up at Ollie's for $2.99 so definitely need to be making a trip to Ollie's. All right so that completes uh, the books that I've read in the last month so I'm going to add them back over to my 2021 stack um, and then I'll probably have to move that after this video because it's going to be way too large. Well I guess we're going to move over to our adult beverage portion of our show. This is from 10 Cap Hard Cider in Wilmington, Ohio. I picked this up Stella's playing with her ball. Um, I picked this up a week or so ago. It's the Mad Mango uh, Hard Cider. They make it there themselves. This isn't a growler. I can't remember. Maybe they call it a howler. <laughs> um, I don't think it tells me how many ounces are in that. But super good. So that's what we're going to move to now is I continue talking to you about books. So if you follow me on social media, I try my very best to recommend a book a day um, on Goodreads and then throw it out there. So although these are ones that I've like read and I recommend, um, I obviously don't finish a book every day. So I go back and find one that I haven't recommended on Goodreads and I try and add one of those every day. Um, I add them for my class also. So sometimes if I've already recommended it, but I was recommended for my class, it might not go on to Facebook. Um, but we'll get caught up on all those anyway. But there are a couple that I wanted to mention to you that I added here in the last little bit. Some of them are seasonal, um, and one of those that I love is this hundreds, hundreds of things to do on a rainy day. I think it's a super cute little edition. Um, it says it is published by Stanyan Books. I just, I love everything about it. I've had this on my shelf, I don't know, for years. Um, I don't think it was mine when I was younger. I think I picked it up somewhere, but it is a lovely little book. It has some graphics in there. And then it's just a list of things that you could do on a rainy day. Think of all your clothes that need pressing. Press them. No, thank you. Throw out that old marmalade. Do not throw out the jar. Glass doesn't decompose. Round up all your waste glass. On the first sunny day, take it all of your local glass to a local glass reclam reclamation center. I'm guessing that means recycling center. Uh, play darts. Go up to your attic. This is guaranteed to while away an entire day. How many words can you make out of the letters in Crocodile? So just a super cute little book. So I did add that to your Goodreads. Love is Walking Hand in Hand, this little Charlie Brown book. I put the review out there for that because we had covered this in class. I did it as a reading um, prompt one day. I read it to them, like Love is Passing Notes Back and Forth to School. So every day, again, I will recommend a book. Um, every day we tried to give about 10 minutes to do our independent reading and then we ended class almost every day with five to 10 minutes of a short or a longer um, journal prompt. So for this day, um, it was a guiding journal prompt. So I read the book to them and then I asked them to, as I'm reading, think of other things that mean for you what love is. And so we made a great little list of that and people shared and it was a lovely little um, activity. So I added that one on Goodreads. Charles Schultz created the comic strip um, Peanuts. So it was another thing that I mentioned in class and I think more people should know what I'm talking about and they just don't. So that's really been a joy this year to uh, bring something in and mention it and if they don't know it, to know that I've introduced them to something such as Peanuts and Charles Schultz. So that's been fun. 
I've added numerous uh, Christmas reviews too, trying to catch some of those up on my shelf, but I'm holding off to talk to you about those until Christmas comes so that it's seasonal. I noticed that I did not have a review out there for Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. I love this book. This is a easy to recommend. It is a little bit thicker um, science fiction, but I feel like this is definitely one that, especially as a freshman, if you like science fiction or if you don't know what you like and then you start reading it and you're like, oh, I really like this, then I'm like, hey, you like science fiction. This is a genre you might want to stick with. Um, and although uh, Orson Scott Card is has a lot to say, um, it's beautifully written and it's an easy one that I feel like sometimes people just fall into and then they read his whole series. I know it happened a lot when I was in the library. This uh, paperback one that I picked up somewhere, um, it says, uh, or it's the movie, it has the movie color. It has the, it must be like the paperback movie edition, um, tie-in or whatever you want to call that. So I did throw that review out there on Goodreads too. Ender's Game is actually what is called a quintet. Um, because there are four books in the Ender Saga, is what they call the series. Andrew Ender Wiggins is a computer genius, and he is recruited um, by his society to go in and play these war games um, to see if they can find a way to defeat the um, invasion of another species. By the age of six, he's groomed to do this, and he's taken from his family to do it. But it's not quite that cut and dry. Um, it's a dark series super well thought out we meet ender and the others that are being trained and in the series some of the other books are from some of the other characters point of view but those that are in control might claim to have the world's best interest at heart but ender is not quite so sure so it's just a fabulous read i highly recommend it to people who know that they like science fiction and then also to some of the guys that um, come in and they're just not quite sure they're not great they're not big readers yet um, that that's definitely a series they can get hooked on. Another book that I recently put a review out there for, I don't have a copy of it, but it's Sarah Gruen's um, Water for Elephants. I do have a copy of her other book called Ape House, which I've not read, so this is going on my short list. But Water for Elephants came back onto my radar um, in the last month because there was an article that was put out there, I believe in Vanity Fair, and I believe it was in Vanity Fair, and it's called How Sarah Gruen Lost Her Life the Water for Elephants author's six-year fight to free an incarcerated man left her absolutely broke and critically ill. What? <laughs> how, how has this been going on for six years and somehow I never heard anything about it? And then the article, which is surprisingly long, it's kind of lengthy, of course, I printed out because I love articles and to go back and flip through, but um, it's insane. It's an insane story. I don't know if you remember, I'm now reading The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn, and um, there was an article, and I believe that was maybe Vanity Fair too, that came out that talked about his background, and it's crazy. It's insane. Um, it's true life is crazier than fiction sometimes. Um, I really enjoyed that article and shared that one with you. This is very much on par with that, so I'm putting the link again in the notes, um, how Sarah Gruen lost her life. Uh, it's, it's just crazy. She gets sucked in to trying to help this guy that she thinks might be innocent and she just keeps giving him her time and her money and her attention and her health starts failing and her she puts her family in peril and it's just this crazy story so anywho I did go back and review Water for Elephants because it's a beautiful book I love it I still have not seen the movie so that's on my movies of my list of movies that I want to watch this summer um, but I have her ape house, so I want to go back and read that because she is an excellent author. And it's just so hard to mesh sometimes. These authors that we read their books that are just fascinating, talented, ridiculously intelligent people. And then some of the things that they do that you're like, how did that spiral out of control? So that one's on my list. It also tells us how some of these authors' lives um, are not as glamorous as we think that they should be. Like... I envision that I might be an author someday and I will sit in here and I will type up my book and I will look out on my beautiful lawn and everything will be peaceful and my door will be open and things will be free. And then you read one of these articles about how sometimes their readers, um, you know, want more from them than they should, than they're entitled to, or um, how some of their readers will threaten their life or send things to them that are scary or creepy or stalkerish. And, 
then I decide maybe I'll just continue teaching high school freshmen and we'll just stay there because <laughs> I don't want the whole world to know me maybe. <laughs> I'm just gonna make these videos that very few people watch. <laughs> Anywho, it was an interesting one. Water for Elephants when it was published, I just remember it being such a fresh read. It is a historical novel because you get, um, uh, it's the story of Jacob who is in a nursing home and he is remembering back when he was the person who was responsible for watering the elephants and the life at the circus during that time and what happened and there's a whole, um, you know, love and mystery that goes in through that and tormented love. It's a beautiful, beautiful story um, and it was very unique at the time for sure. So the story focuses on Jacob who is almost finished with vet school when he finds out that his parents have been killed and he can no longer afford to finish that out. So he goes to work for a circus where he meets Marlena and August um, who are the people who are running the circus and he falls in love with someone that he shouldn't um, and that person is in a terrible relationship and then he meets Rosie the elephant that he is taking care of and he feels like that is his job, like that is his purpose is to take care of that elephant and then also to save the woman that he's in love with who's not in a good, safe relationship. So if you're looking for a story to take you away this summer, Water for Elephants should definitely be on your list. Our book club read Eleanor Oliphant is perfect, no, oh, our book club read Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Um, and I actually picked up a copy of it, of it at um, like Goodwill, like for like a day, maybe a day or two before um, we had our book club meeting. Uh, but then I immediately then just handed it to someone else, which is why I like to own my books. I want to read them. I want to recommend them. I want to hand them to you. <laughs> so I don't have a copy of it here to show you, but I did um, review that on Goodreads back in August of 2019 when I read it but our book club had a great discussion on it. I was thinking about doing another breakout video of like um, book club books, like when I read them, what I think about them. So like the before the book club and the after the book club. So putting that on the list of things to do this summer. I listened to the audio of it. I think it was a really good uh, way to experience the book because Eleanor is such a dry, different kind of person to start with. Um, but uh, it's just, it's one of those that keeps coming back over and over again. And I feel like a lot of book clubs have done that book. It reminds me of like A Man Called Ove, or maybe The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, kind of around those. But I'm so happy that in the end, Eleanor finds her people. Those are probably my favorite kind of books, where there's a different kind of character that is misunderstood or just can't find their place, and then they find their people. There are a lot of young adult books that are like that that I like. John Green's very big on those kinds of books. But I like any book that has that character where they are unique and different and they find their people because isn't that a lot of our stories. Another book that I just want to throw out there is Milk and Honey by Rupi Carr. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying that exactly right, but this is one of those that one of my students came in and said, oh my gosh, Miss Lovin, have you, have you ever heard of this book? This is amazing. And I have heard of this book. I've had it recommended numerous times. I've read it. I love it. And I always say, but no, we cannot put this on our shelf. I can't have a copy of this in here because of page 13. <laughs> um, you know, she has these poems, little, little memoirish poems with drawings. And um, not all of the drawings are super appropriate for, say, you know, a school classroom. There are very some artistic impressions that are in here that are just lovely. But there are definitely some that if um, someone were just to flip through to that one page, Number one, they would take the book and I would never see it again. Or number two, their mom would take the book and be like, what are you thinking? <laughs> but I just remembered when she came in and she said, have you ever heard of this book before? I just remembered how much I really enjoyed and appreciated this book. Um, I read another of her books. It's, I think, called the Sun and the St Her Sun and the Stars or something like that. Um, I don't know that I have a copy of that one. But this is one of those books that I read it. You can find a lot of the um, pages of this on Pinterest. If you look up Milk and Honey and Rupi Kaur, K-A-U-R, you can find a lot of these illustrations with the, um, with the poems that go along with it. Uh, but I think that this one was a more um, honest, natural telling of her story through poetry than Her Son and the Stars. Um, but I still liked that one too. So I would recommend any of hers 
either just experiencing some of the poems through maybe Pinterest or even her website probably has a couple on there um, or actually purchasing the book. This is one of those books that I went out and paid full price for because I just really wanted to own it and be able to pick it up from time to time and flip it open and read one. Um, I mean, they're very short. You must enter a relationship with yourself before anyone else. That's it. Accept that you deserve more than painful love. Life is moving. The healthiest thing for your heart is to move with it. They're like affirmations. Rivers fall from my mouth. Tears my eyes can't carry. You are snakeskin and I keep shedding you somehow. My mind is forgetting every exquisite detail of your face. The letting go has become the forgetting, which is the most pleasant and saddest thing to have happened. Just little snippets of really honest feelings. Love it. Highly recommend it. Two more I'm going to throw out there. Ooh, I was just thinking, I don't know if I have those on Goodreads. I do. This one I put out there August 28th of 2019 is Lori Halls Anderson, who is the author of Speak, which is what she's really well known for. But this one's called Prom Speak. Every person should have to read that book, especially every eighth grader and ninth grader in America. Um, but everyone should read it. But this is just a fun one by her called Prom. So a little seasonal there. And I put that out on Goodreads back in 2019. So just um, telling you that it's a good humorous read by Lori Halls Anderson. The author of Speak, which is super serious, and this one is not. Premise is there's a two friends. One has just like waited her entire life to go to prom. The other one is her friend. And uh, when prom comes around, the prom director and all the money has disappeared. So they have to find a way to pull off a prom. So super fun. The other one is called 21 Proms here. And uh, it has lots of stories by people, authors that you know, like Libba Bray, John Green, Holly Black, Jacqueline Woodson. So they're just little short stories about prom. Um, and I put that out on Goodreads hmm, back in May of 2019. And again, just highly recommended, just a fun seasonal read. A couple of other ones that I would mention, I think I've mentioned Shadow and Bone by uh, Leah Bardugo before. I put that review out there in April of 2019, but that series is now on Netflix. I've only watched the first episode, but very well done. <laughs> Thank you, Stella, for your participation in the book video. Um, she agrees. She sat there and watched it with me and also enjoyed it. Uh, but Shadow and Bones, a really popular one from our high school library. I'm glad that I finally settled into reading Leah Bardugo. Um, she's a fantasy young adult author. It's not my favorite genre, um, but it's one of those that I know a lot of people read and enjoy. So when I read it, I always enjoy it. Um, it's just not my favorite genre. Although it is a series, that first book does wrap up at the end so that it doesn't just leave you hanging. That's my biggest beef with um, a lot of young adult series is that it's really just one big book. So at the end of a book, it leaves you hanging so that it just, there's no completion. You could read Shadow and Bone and be good with that if you wanted to, but it's a really good series. I have read Six of Crows by her also, and I really enjoyed that one. That one's really unique because it's told from different people's points of view. Um, I think there are six, Six of Crows. There are six uh, young adults in this fictional fantasy world. They each have different gifts. And where one stops telling their story, the next person picks up the story. So it's not each of them telling the same uh, portion of the story. They're just telling the same story and they pick up at different times. Super good. Love Six of Crows. I did really like Shadow and Bone too though. So I would recommend it if you are watching that on Netflix and you're wondering if the book is worth it. So worth it. I read Six of Crows back in 2017 looks like. Six of Crows is more like that. At the end, it is ending it and really just setting it up for the next book. So not as crazy on how she ended Six of Crows as how she ended Shadow and Bone, the very first book in the series. Um, I don't know that I've talked to you about At Home in Mitford before, but this is Jan Karen. This is another one of my favorite series of all time. Very cozy, not mystery, just realistic fiction. It follows a, a minister... What kind of minister is he? They call him Father Tim. I can't remember what kind of church it is, but um, he, uh, you follow Father Tim moving into Mitford, a very small town where you get to meet all these people. So great community. Um, and then throughout the series, Father Tim falls in love, not only with Mitford, but in somebody who moves to Mitford. So a great love story drawn in there. Super cozy series. Um, and I'm bringing it up now because Hallmark keeps playing um, their movie edition of At Home in Mifford, which I feel like is um, maybe one, two, maybe one, two, three of the series all into one. 
Um, I am so not a big fan of the way that they turned it into the movie. There are some really good people in there, like stars that I like in other things. Um, I can't think of her name. That's terrible that I can't think of her name because she's in a lot of shows. But um, my problem with the making it into the movie is they just glaze the surface. Like if you haven't read the series, it just does not do it justice because this series is lovely. I loved reading the series. I should probably go back and listen to them on audio because they would just be a comfort. They are a comfort read. So, um, and there's a lot. I mean, I want to say, I don't know that I have down how many are in the series, but I bet there's probably 10 in the series. I have them back here. So I'll try and pull those out and maybe review those this summer too. But I love Father Tim and Mitford. And it's still that like, don't skip it. Like if you've read the books, you still want to watch the movie. It's just not great. Um, you know, sit down and scroll through social media while you're doing it or something because you're going, you're going to want to experience it, but um, it just, it's just not, it does not do the book justice. I do want to mention again, I reviewed back in October, A Million Reasons Why by Jessica Strasser, um, and I reviewed that book through NetGalley, so I reviewed it before it actually came out. And it has been published. It was published in March of this year. So I just want to say one more time, well worth the read. Um, it reads kind of like a Jodi Picoult book where you are faced with a situation that you're like, oh, yeah, that's difficult. I'm not sure how I feel about that. But I think I knew how I feel about that. And then you meet these characters and you undergo what they're going through. And then you realize that it's way more complicated and we should really not be judgmental people. <laughs> so in this particular one, there um, is a sister who gives her dad, I think it is, I think it's her dad, um, the gift of one of those DNA kits for Christmas. And she does that for him. And she finds that she has more family than he's told her about. Um, and then it gets more complicated from there because they need more from her than just a relationship. So super good. I really enjoyed it. It's a real page turner and it's also one of the great endings in a book. I, um, you know, I love those books that have quirky characters where they find their people. And then I really love watching the growth of a character when you take a character and b between the beginning and the end, you're just like, you have just grown exponentially. Like you've just become a character that we could be friends and we could sit down and talk about this. I love those kinds of books and A Million Reasons Why is definitely one of those books. It's one of those books where multiple characters are trying to find their way and they're just getting thrown curveballs during the whole thing. And it's just super fun to go along for the ride. I'm gonna link an article for you. Um, I shared it on social media within the last month. It's 11 books that are better in the spring. And there are a couple in there that I would highly recommend. Of course, any Jane Austen, but they have Persuasion on there. Um, and then a couple that are on my reading list, like The Wind in the Willows, I would really like to read that, and I think that's probably a spring book. But Major Pettigrew's Last Stand by Helen S uh, Simonson is on there, and I love that book. Um, again, A Whole Made Life is on my book of list to read, on my list of books to read. Anna Green Gables is on there, one of my favorite books of all time. Um, so several books that they say are better written in spring, I think it's from Miss Darcy's um, book blog which if you're not following, Miss Darcy is a great book blog to follow. Well, uh, I also heard that Lord of the Rings is gonna have another resurgent. Their Amazon is going to make the series again. So I just book talked um, J.R.R. Tolkien in my class this past week. And I did not have a lot of freshmen that either watch the movies or read the series, which I think is kind of interesting because I feel like it's a pretty popular series. So I hope to maybe get at least one of them to start reading it. In other book news, Anthony Horowitz has a new book coming out called A Line to Kill. I uh, read his Magpie Murders earlier in the year and did a uh, review, so I plan on reading all of his books. He's definitely going to be an author that has earned my respect, um, and I know that I like his stuff, so I will be reading any of his books. April 24th was Independent Book Day, so I hate that I missed mentioning that in my last video and it's taken place, but I put it on my calendar so that next time we'll talk about it before it comes up. But remember to support your local independent bookstores. I'm also linking an article that I shared um, in the last month 
that is called Five Crime Writers Who Turned Out to Be Actual Murderers. And one of those is Anne Perry. She's a best-selling crime novelist, and she is actually a convicted murderer. Um, that This happened when I think she was 15 or 16 years old. So that's how she's out and able to write about it. But it's a super interesting um, article that mentions several other people who have committed murder, been convicted, and then go on to write murder mysteries. <laughs> But Ann Perry is definitely the one that caught my eye when I was like, oh, really? Like, these are going to be obscure people. Maybe not. Also linking an article about book clubs. It's called How Women Invented Book Clubs Revolutionizing Reading in Their Own Lives. I know I talk a lot about my book club on here. I love them. I've been heading that up for 22 years, 21 years, something like that. Um, so it's been out there for a long time and I get a lot of pleasure out of it and I'm always interested when I read these articles that talk about the community of book clubs. Another article that I will link below is every 2021 book to movie and TV series adaptation is from the bibliophile. So definitely added to my list of things to read and watch. On my um, borrowed book list, I have Firefly Lane and um, Bridgerton. Both of those are on my summer to read list. But there's a number of them on there. One that's on there, A Discovery of Witches. I know I had heard a lot about that. And um, I think it was on Roku. I feel like it was Roku. On something, I went and it was like you could watch it there, but you could only watch the first episode. So I watched that, and of course now I'm hooked. But I cannot pay for one more platform to have to pay for to watch something. So hopefully it'll come out somewhere else so that I can watch it. But it also covers The Shadow and Bone that is already out there in Netflix. The Chaos Walking series, the Nest one that, again, I read and recommended earlier this year that I would like to watch that one. Any Agatha Christie, Death on the Nile, Nightingale, those are all going to be coming out this year, apparently. Woman in the Window, which I'm currently reading and hit Netflix yesterday. But I'll link that article for you, too, um, so that you can make your list of things to read before you watch. And then I'm always interested when um, there's an article out there or a lot of these I find when I'm listening to NPR and then it's like I go to look up more information about what I've heard and then there's an article linked to that or a book that it links to. That's how I get a lot of my reading material. Also, I, you know, I love articles. Um, I just think they're nice short snippets and it keeps me as that lifelong learner. I'm always pushing those out there on my social media and presenting them to my class. Um, and another one that came out in the last month, this came out April 15th on NPR, but the pandemic draws former Shilato's fashion illustrator back to what she loves. And I listened to the segment. I thought it was super interesting. Again, it's local. Shilato's is local to downtown Cincinnati. And then when I came home and followed the link, it just has the best um, graphics on there. So there's pictures of this illustrator. And I mean, you can kind of see here, here's her back then and then now with her daughter. Um, and during quarantine, her daughter gave her a platform to go and share some of her drawings. And she started getting back into um, drawing and her illustrations, which is where her career was all these years ago. And they're just these fabulous graphics. So I'm going to link that down there too. And we'll just call that our article of the podcast today um, because it was just so interesting. We have a book in the library called Those Who Wish Me Dead. And um, that is getting turned into a movie or has been turned into a movie. So you might want to take a look at that trailer. So I know my video has already gotten way too long and I've only covered the books that I've read, the books that I've been lately reviewing. Um, and I haven't even done my book haul yet. So maybe I'm going to have to break that book haul out separately. Um, but I know that I really want to talk about my summer reading too. But I think I'm going to do that in a shorter video after I get out of school. So we have five, six, seven days with kids and then a work day, um, and then maybe I'll do another video just talking about what's on my summer reading list. But here's my short summer reading list, um, the short list, and then I have right behind it, like all this whole stack, including Mexican Gothic, of books that people have loaned to me here lately. So my uh, summer game plan is to read all of those borrowed books and get those back to people because if they're like me, they have a certain place on their shelf that those books go. So it's not right that I hang on to them too long. So uh, those will be on my summer reading list. Um, and then just a number of other uh, summer seasonal reads. I also want to talk to you about some books that I've read that are very summer themed so that you can make your own reading list. So I'll break that out into a separate video. So let's talk some book haul because that should be fairly 
quick since I'm not going to review them for you just yet, but I do want to talk to you about some of these books that I was able to pick up in the last month. I have gone book shopping uh, quite a bit in the last month. Um, I don't know why. Springtime, the you know COVID restrictions being lifted. I want to get out there. I needed to pick up books for my classroom. So for some reason, we're running around more, so I'm going by Goodwill more and more. Um, so a couple books I really wanted to talk to you about that I did pick up. When I was in Florida, this was in a bookshop down there, and I loved it. It's called A Perfectly Kept House is the Sign of a Misspent Life by Mary Randolph Carter. Um, it's published by Rizzoli, New York. How to Live Creatively with Collections, Clutter, Works, Kids, Pets, Art, etc. And Stop Worrying About Everything Being Exactly in Its Place. Um, however, it was $60 in the bookstore down there on uh, in Inglewood, Florida, where I was visiting my cousin at one of the little boutique shops. And I cannot pay $60 for a book, no matter how pretty it is. I can't do it. So... Um, my cousin said, hey, have you ever gone on to eBay? She buys a lot of her books that way. And then she said, you know, she doesn't feel guilty then passing them on because they're super cheap. I'm like, yeah, but you know, that's not going to be on there. It's not like it's a, you know, paperback copy of At Home in Mitford. And it was. <laughs> it was totally on there. Um, I'll have to look and see if I know how much I paid for it. But it wasn't very much. Now, it does have a little bit like of wear and tear here. There's just a little bitty tear here. Um, but it's well worth the not having to pay $60, but still being able to have it in my possession. It is a beautiful book that I want to look through, and it's on my reading list this summer. Let me show you some of that. I want to say I paid maybe $15 for it. And, you know, it's a hardback, beautifully um, photographed book, like a coffee table kind of book. Um, so I feel like it was definitely worth the $15 there. Pretty sure it was about $15. But I purchased that from eBay. Um, it was a place called Bellwether Books. So well done, very well done. Like I said, minimal um, wear and tear on the book, enough that I'm not bothered by it. So it was my birthday last month and I did get a book. It is a book club book. A friend of mine went to Seaside, Florida uh, to Sundog Books, independent bookstore, and uh, gifted me this nice little book club. It's a journal. So there's a place for you to put your uh, meeting notes, your personal reflections, keep your reading list in there. So I started this off with Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine uh, and made some notes to take with me to my book club meeting. Also, while we were walking in Inglewood, Florida, they had several little libraries that we would pass. And I picked this up in one of the little libraries. It's uh, Leanne Moriarty, who did The Husband's Secret and Big Little Lies, both of which I love. This is what Alice forgot. Uh, they did turn it into a movie, according to the front of this. So that, again, is on my short list for the summer. I'd like to do a, a little segment on little libraries. We don't have a ton that I um, see down here. There's a couple in front of our schools um, that are not really stocked, or I don't even know that they're really used that much. There's not a big turnaround in those um, little libraries that are in front of our schools, surprisingly enough. There's another one that's down by one of our, um, there's a, a book supplier that has a place there in Blanchester and there's a little library in front of them and I feel like there's one more floating around out there somewhere but um, every time we walked by her little libraries in her neighborhood there was there was a good turnover so that was fun and then when I came back home I uh, did send her a book to take back to the little library so it was take one leave one um, and sent one in there for that I picked up a couple of uh, magazine journal -y type things this Breathe Staying Home. Um, I enjoy these, wellness, kindness, mindfulness, inspiration. I enjoy flipping through those. This was the April um, edition, the Staying Home Special, uh, and I've been reading through that. Lots of just, again, little articles on wellness and um, reading and uh, breathing, all of those are kind of in here. There's one that says shelf awareness and just beautiful pictures and graphics. So I picked that one up, and I also picked up this one, Houseplants. I be, believe both of these came from Barnes & Noble, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I had to get this houseplant one because at the time, my money tree, every leaf fell off of it. And I thought, well, it must just not like the inside, like I've killed it. And then I'm looking over there now, and the leaves are back, and they're like the size of my arm. Like, they're massive. So apparently, it just needed to shed and come back. So um, I bought this because I'm like, well, I probably should read up a little bit on these houseplants that I'm killing. 
Um, so both of those are on my reading list too. I've been flipping through them, but I need to actually go through and finish them. All right, let me take a break and move things around. All right, I'm gonna talk book haul, but I'm gonna be very quick. I am not reviewing these, so I won't put them on the review shelf. I will review them later, like in the summer, but I do wanna show you what I picked up and tell you where I picked up some of my books. You know I've talked in the, in the past about the fact that I don't pay retail for very many books. Um, most of my books I get at Goodwill, thrift shops, trading with other people, or pick them up somewhere. I just, I don't pay retail for the majority of my books. So one of the places that I visited in the last month and picked up quite a few books was St. Vincent de Paul's Thrift Store down in Milford, Ohio. They have a new store in the last, I'd say, year and a half or so. Um, I was able to visit this quite a bit last summer whenever I was meeting my cousin to walk. The place that we would meet and carpool over to the um, park was very close to pop into this store and pick things up and they usually have a pretty decent book um, selection. So here are some of the ones that I picked up from St. Vincent de Paul. Um, I don't have it written on here, but I think their books are about $1.50 to $2, depending on hardback or um, if it's a paperback maybe. So some books I pick up for my classroom, some books, I, some books I pick up for my shelf. I like to have a copy of books that I've read. I often will pick up a copy of a book that I know that I've heard the title and that I want to read it. Um, and then, especially right now, I am trying to stock my library in my classroom so that I can recommend a book and just hand it to a student. Another reason I really like to have a copy of the books that I've read is I am always talking to people <laughs> about books and I like when they say, oh, do you have a copy of that? And I say, yes, I do. Let me go pull it off of my shelf. And that has been another great advantage to my COVID bookshelves that my husband built for me um, last year. My books that I read usually, or before this, were put on a shelf in my bedroom about like 10 foot, is it 10 foot ceilings, 12 foot ceilings? I don't know, ridiculous ceilings. Um, and there was a shelf up in my bedroom and that's where all the books that I had read went to. So whenever somebody wanted to borrow something, I had to go get a ladder, take it up the two flights of stairs and then get it from there. So this has been wonderful because yes, I still have to get a ladder, but it's right here on my ground floor. Um, and I play in my shelves all the time. It's kind of like um, how I play in my closet where I move things around and I group them and I organize them and I you know, make outfits and here I pull down books and I talk about the ones that I put a pile together of the ones that I wanna talk about and I review them every day or um, I talk to people about it and they wanna borrow a book and so I'm like, hey, I just need to pull it from my shelf. I'll bring it in for you tomorrow or I'll bring it this weekend. So I love that part of having my bookshelves right here with books that I've already read and books that I want to read. So again, this summer, big plan, I wanna give you a bookshelf tour um, so that you can see how I do organize my books because I am a librarian by trade. So from St. Vincent de Paul, I bought um, three books that I've already taken to school so I can't show you, but I got um, Gordon Corman's Son of the Mob. Um, my, and this is a little odd, but like, there are a lot of things this year that I will mention something and then realize they don't know what I'm talking about. And several times it have, it's been biblical references, either in literature or just in something that's come up. Like this week, it was the golden rule. Um, we had eighth graders coming over to take tours in our building. So I told the kids, hey, remember the golden rule? Blank stares. They have no idea what I'm talking about. So then I explained to them what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this is a biblical reference. And then I questioned myself and I looked it up and yes, there are Bible verses that lend itself to the golden rule, but actually most cultures and most religions have something very similar to the golden rule because it's just a human principle. But um, I learned early on that I needed a copy of the Bible in my classroom. Someone had donated one that was a version that just was archaic. It was very difficult for me to read anything from that. So I picked one up at St. Vincent de Paul. It's a little pink one. It's tiny, um, but I think it was ESV. But anywho, it's a more readable version. Um, so I looked up those verses and then read those to them. So I don't feel like that's a violation of church and state whenever it's a reference and it's something that we should all know. How do we not know what the golden rule is? Um, so super eye-opening, but I got another copy of the Bible for our classroom. And then I got a copy 
of, uh, oh, actually I pulled some of these from my shelf. So these are not the ones I bought in the store, but I have a copy in here of Son of the Mob Hollywood Hustle, which is the second one to Gordon Corman um, on my shelves. I don't have a copy of Son of the Mob apparently. And then Nancy Farmer's The House of Scorpion. I had a copy here and I picked up a copy and took it to school and reviewed it for them. The third one that I took to school already that I have a copy here, so I'm showing you my copy, is Bleachers by John Grisham. And that was a nice one that I got to read like on First Chapter Friday. One of the classes chose that one for me to read from, and it is a great first chapter, um, super easy to get people interested in, and a great story. I said I wasn't going to talk about every one of these, and I've talked about every one of these. And I picked up a few for my shelf that I didn't have a copy of, like Lois Lowry's The Giver. I did not have a copy of that. Will Grayson, Will Grayson by John Green and David Levithan. I always have a hard time saying his last name, but this is one of my favorite John Green, so I got a copy of that. I got a copy of The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I hope to find a better copy of this and then put this one on my shelf at school because it's pretty banged up. But um, I wanted one so that I could at least review it, get it to you, and then I'll look for a better copy. Um... Yep, that takes care of all the ones from St. Vincent to Paul. The next place I hit was the Goodwill Boutique um, in Montgomery, I believe it is. Uh, so we have Goodwills that are just general Goodwills, and then there's this boutique in Montgomery that has a select better assortment of things. They have maybe like one bookshelf that um, just has a couple of shelves on it, one bookcase with a couple of bookshelves on it. Um, but they always have really good selections. So I got these from there. I got Artemis Fowl, The Arctic Incident. This is the second one in the Artemis Fowl series that I love. I got this copy, Deborah Harkness, The World of All the Saints. And this is from The Discovery of Witches that I talked about earlier where I only got to see the first episode. If you know somewhere that I can watch um, more than just the first episode without having to subscribe to another platform, please let me know because I really did enjoy it. Um, I picked up, if it didn't, or it didn't start with you, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle by Mark Wolin. That looks like a really good nonfiction read. And this one, I'm not sure if I got it there or where I got it, so I'm kind of you know, putting it in between, but it's The Bad Beginning. I've already read the, um, a couple in the Lemony Snicket, um, the series of unfortunate events, and we have a couple copies at school, but I didn't have a copy here, so I picked that one up for me. Yeah, I, I think that but I think the next ones also came from that Goodwill boutique. I hit it twice in the last month because I was there for an appointment too in the area and I'm like, I'm just gonna pop in and then they had a bunch of good ones. Cross my heart and hope to spy, Allie Carter. I have not read any of these, but look at that cover. Like that's totally gonna be um, something my girls are gonna get into. So I'm gonna try and read one of those this summer and see. Just make sure that they're okay. But um gonna put that cop gonna put these read these copies and then put those in the library too. Um, I picked up a copy of Sarah's Key. I have already read this one. It's by Tatiana de Rosny. If you like historical fiction, that's a good one. So I'll review that one for you. Masterminds, another Gordon Corman. I just really like Gordon Corman. Um, so I picked that one up. I picked up a copy of The Rifle by Gary Paulson. Super short, but I like to have all kinds under my belt so that I have things that I can recommend to them. Um, the Short Second Life of Brie Tanner. Short Second Life of Brie Tanner. Yes. This is an Eclipse novella. Yeah, novella. Again, already read it, but didn't have a copy um, in here, so I picked that up. The River by Gary Paulson. So Gary Paulson, um, I read Winter Dance and reviewed for you uh, maybe earlier. I think it's in the stack here, or the Iditarod's in here. I can't remember. Is that the same thing? It's the same thing, yeah. So I just wanted to get a couple more Paulsons under my belt, short ones. Um, for my struggling readers that um, come in and I don't have as many things to tell them about. I picked up a copy of Alana the First Adventure by Tamara Price, Pierce. Sorry, I've already read this one too. And then I haven't read this Jill Chavis, but my gosh, her books are everywhere. They're at Kroger, they're at Target. Um, so I picked up a couple of her copies here lately and I plan to put these on my um, reading list. Now this is hot winter night, so I will read it this winter, but um, I picked up a copy, a couple of her books here lately, quite a few of those. The next group of books came from the Book Rack. It's a secondhand bookshop in Murray, Kentucky. My son graduated from college last weekend, so we made the trip down there. It's about six, six and a half hours. 
and uh, it was really cool. There was like a sporting goods store, so my husband was going in there looking for fishing lures and such, and then this was right next door. I'm like, you could not have planned that better. Um, super interesting little store, downstairs, very well stocked uh, paperbacks, and then upstairs, very well stocked hardbacks. And again, super um, good, so super reasonable, I should say. So uh, picked those up, spent about $40, I think, overall on these. So I picked up two copies of She Said Yes. I already have a copy in my classroom, but it gets circulated quite a bit. It is not, not in the best shape, so I picked up another copy for the classroom and then a copy for me. I picked up a copy of Five Feet Apart. This has been very popular. I know some of my girls have read it. I don't have a copy of it. I haven't read it, um, but picked that one up for us. Uh, Britt Marie was here, Frederick Backman, the author of A Man Called Ove, which I loved, and I, again, wanted to read some more by him. So many books, so little time of year, passionate reading. I have no idea what it is, but looks super interesting. Jody Thomas, the Little Tea Shop in on Maine. Again, I don't recognize the author or the title, but was drawn in by the loveliness of the book. And it was $5.00. Murray, sorry, Mary Market Murder, A Farmer's Market Mystery, obviously a cozy mystery. It's by Paige Shelton. I have read several books by her, not in this series, but just another little cute one. It's like $4. Modern Lovers by Emma Straub. I've not read Emma Straub before, but I've seen her book. She's very popular, so I thought that would be a good one to pick up and uh, put on my list. Looks like it might be a summer read. I picked up a Cleo Coyle. You know, I read all of her books. Um, and this is Dead to the Last Drop um, in the Coffee House Mystery Series. It was $4, and I don't have a copy of it, and I haven't read that one yet. When You Reach Me, I think I have a copy, and I also have a copy in the classroom, but I got an extra copy because it's a Newberry Award winner. I've recommended it, and I really want my kids to read it. So I'd like to have more copies of that one. I've already read The Boys in the Boat, but I don't have a copy of it, so I wanted to grab that one. Always on the lookout for book of the month, um, book club editions, because um, I, a couple of years ago, made that resolution to read more modern fiction. I kind of got caught up in the always reading what's in my library and young adult, and I realized that I was not having good conversations with adult people <laughs> um, on like what everybody else was reading. So a couple of years ago, I switched over and tried to mix in more of that. And a really good way for me to find out what's good and popular is that book of the month club which I'm not a part of, but I always like pick those up. So they're always really good additions. They're so pretty. They're just, and I love that. So you can see where are they at, right up here somewhere, I think. I don't know where they're at, I can't see them. But somewhere up here, I have some of them um, that I've read some and then I've got some on my to be read list. And then the last one is 13 Little Blue Envelopes. Um, and I got this copy for school because I already have one here and just super cute book that'll be easy to recommend. So all of those came from the book rack in Murray, Kentucky, and I think both of these stacks were about $40. I'm happy with that. And then the last book haul that I have comes from a regular Goodwill. I think it was the Loveland Goodwill, if I'm not mistaken, um, where, again, I had an appointment, so I just popped in for a minute just to see what kind of books they had and got some really good ones. That's where Submerged came from. <clears throat> the one that I've already book talked that I read back in April. I picked up a copy of Rachel's Tears. I thought I already read this and then it's not on my list of DeShannon's reading list of, book, of dates. Um, and I don't seem to have a copy on my shelf. So I guess I'm going to have to actually read it. But it's 10 years after Columbine, Rachel Scott's Faith Lives On. I thought I already read it. I have it in the high school library, but it's not on my list. So I'm going to have to read it again. Um, or read it for the first time. I picked up another copy of The Historian because it's one of my all-time favorite books. I have a copy here so I can put this on my classroom shelf. Um, Anthony Horowitz Stormbreaker. Uh, again, I read Anthony Horowitz Magpie Murders, so I want to read everything that he writes. I really enjoyed it. Life of Pi I've already read, but I didn't have a copy of. Eleanor and Park I have a copy of, so I got this for the classroom by Rainbow Rowell. And the other Einstein, I just had somebody recommend this to me. And so luckily that's the kicker with having those book conversations. When somebody recommends something to me um, or I hear it over and over again when I'm at Goodwill and a book is $2, then I'm like, oh, that's one I know I need to put on my to be read shelf. So picking that one up, I think a lot of book clubs are doing this one. So whoever recommended it to me, thank you. So in addition to the books that I've read, the book haul, 
the books that I've reviewed. Um, I always like to mention to you if I visited an independent coffee place and I did several in Florida um, and then I did a couple here. Um, Harvest Market is the one that comes to mind. I'll have to catch you up on some of the others in a later video. Like I said, I just, I didn't want to put it off any longer. I wanted to make this video, get these books put up and uh, get in our final week of school um, and just get everything out there. Uh, because I feel like I, I wait until everything's perfect and then I've waited too long. Things start piling up too much and then my video is over an hour. Um, so a couple of independent coffee shops, Harvest uh, Market is one of them down in Old Milford. Super fun. Um, things that I don't even understand what they mean. Like you have to ask, like, what is that? I think that's always interesting. I linked a couple of podcasts for you in the show notes too. Um, the Bibliovert podcast uh, has one that where they talk about the throne of glass. So I thought that was really interesting. And Flourish Planner, who I've been following, I ordered a new iPad, so I plan to use it to do my videos and do some editing and hopefully spice up those videos a little bit this summer. Um, but Flourish Planner has been talking about Throne of Glass, and I've never read Sarah Moss's Throne of Glass, so that's definitely on my summer read list. But I put that um, podcast down there. I also listened to The Aggressive Life by Brian Telm. I have probably already um, told you about his podcast. He's our pastor. Uh, we've, not been, we've not been back to church since COVID hit. Um, we've been doing it online or listening to the podcast. So I hope now that we're both fully vaccinated that we will get back into that. Um, but his podcasts are amazing, so I linked that. And then, um, what is that one? Oh, what podcast is that? I have it on here, but I don't have the name of it. But it was Lessons from the, oh, that's what it was. It was The Aggressive Life with Brian Tome, The uh, Lessons from the Spanish Flu with John M. Barry. He's a historian. It was fascinating, fascinating. So that's the podcast episode that I'm linking for you. Um, and I will stop there and push everything else to the next month uh, because I did throw two more out there just in the last couple of days, but I don't have them in the show notes yet. Um, I will link my drink for you as usual. And as always, I am so happy to be your friendly librarian. Thank you for subscribing or watching. Um, it, again, I'm not trying to make a living off of this, but I love sharing with you. I love the feedback that you're giving me. I love to hear what you're reading um, and comments about some of the books that I've recommended. I just enjoy discussing books. I also received this awesome gift from a friend that I will insert a picture for, but it has um, author's names painted on wood. So I've just got to find just the right place in here to put it. I think I know, but I'm terrible about committing to hang things on the wall after our entire house got repainted. But um, I will find a good place for that, but I wanted you to see it because it's lovely and it's perfect for my library. All of the books that I talked to you about, either reading or recommending, I have reviewed for you on Goodreads, except for the book haul books. I put them in a separate location and then I will be reviewing those and bringing those back out there for you or the books that I have on my to be read list. I obviously have not reviewed those yet, but all of the books that I review in Goodreads, I then push over to Facebook or on my other social media. So follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Goodreads to just get daily book love. Remember you can access any of these books for free from your public library. So utilize that resource. Um, I listen to all of my audiobooks through the free resource of my public library on Libby. Let's be social. Hit that subscribe or like button. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, what you want, what you're looking for. And I hope to do a lot of videos more frequently this summer. I've got big plans. You might get two videos pretty close together or that might take me, you know, the next week and a half to edit this one because it is the last week of school and I have a hundred and no, that's not true. I have about 600 papers to grade between now and next weekend. <laughs> Comment, email, message me. Let's discuss books, people. Keep in touch. Enjoy.